The next presentation is from Hexion Inc. Uh, the, the presenter is Scott McIntyre, Director of Fire Safety. Scott is uh, uh, present uh, co-inventor of Armor Built. He's been with the uh, company for 30 years and has more than 45 years experience in the forest products industry. The title of the presentation is Guarding the Grid, Combining Science and Nature to Leverage One of the Safest and Most Sustainable Raw Materials, Wood, for uh, power poles. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, again, Scott McIntyre, 45 years in the timber industry. And I've been with, uh, well, grew up running uh, plywood plants and sawmills, but uh, myself and Mark Clark invented armor built inside of the Hexion structure a couple years ago. And we partnered with Stella Jones, probably the, I'm sure the largest wooden power pole supplier in North America. in the U.S. and uh, west of the uh, Continental Divide. So from a company overview standpoint, I'll just go over that real quick. Hexion, it used to be Borden Chemical. We've been around for over 100 years uh, formulating different resins. We produce and sell billions and billions of pounds of resin each year globally, uh, 34 production uh, facilities about 2,600 associates, and mainly in, uh, you know, say for the timber industry, that's the part I, I was working in, but you can see the, the portion I reside in, or our group, Fire Safety, down below in sales by segment is the adhesives portion, and that's it's about a $2.5 billion company, sales by end market, you all can see that. We do lots of different things, wind energy, automotive, timber, um, so you're talking about plywood, OSB, particle board, all that type of thing, headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Our resin technologies, really, when you think about combining science and nature, what we're talking about is, you know, converting trees into usable wood products. So our, our resins turn wood into cost-effective building materials, I just named a few of them. And to the point of this presentation around guarding the grid, the armor built is a formula that's put on a four foot wide fiberglass mesh. And then we gently blow the holes open while it's after it goes through the dip tank and then up through about a 34 foot vertical dryer. And then they wrap the poles with it. You can see on the right, some of the people we do business with, Louisiana Pacific, Warehouser, Axon Bell, some of them are quite large. We started that automated facility at our Portland site uh, just last year. But you can imagine the level of testing and diligence we went through to make sure that this was safe for linemen, protected from fires. I would suggest that, for instance, I'm sure all of you are aware of the Paradise Fire, I believe in 2018, where 85 people lost their lives. It was quite a tragedy. But uh, there was two poles went down on the only road in and one above the little town and uh, blocked the road for first responders to get in and for people to get out. But I would suggest that if Armorville had been on those poles, they would not have tipped over. They would not have charred and burned and, and fell over blocking that road. But the testing on the diligence side, you look at the picture just to the right of the guard, the grid, that is a correlative test apparatus, three burners, just nine inches from the base of the target material. It puts out 2,100 degrees at 120,000 BTUs and wrapped with armor built, you can see on the uh, far, far right, that is the result of the protected pole uh, after a 10 minute burn at 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit at nine inches. We also impinge three gas fired uh, burners onto the face of the material. And you can see just to the right of the burn apparatus, an unprotected pole section, treated pole. Uh, it just basically chars into ash until it goes away. And right beside that is a wrapped pole that uh, 
uh, one of the big utilities in California has uh, wrapped right now. In fact, one of the larger utilities in California has wrapped over 60,000 poles just themselves. And there's probably, I would guess, somewhere around 80,000 poles already haven't been wrapped with this stuff. Most of them double wrap uh, the armor belt onto the pole. And the reason they do that is just for redundancy. It's kind of a one and done deal. The, the armor belt is an intermescent material that once it sees the right amount of temperature starting at about 380 F, it expands just like the picture behind me. That is actually a third party certified test result where the material intermest and puffs up uh, once it sees about 380 to 400 F. And uh, that went 10 minutes at 2,100 degrees for uh, at nine inches. And it barely sunburns the wood. Okay. And when they send you this uh, PDF, that is a video on the left where it says guard the grid, you can click on that armor built 1.0 and watch the video. And just to share what's going on here, we designed this for safety and saving lives. And it's really about the linemen. You can never ever forget about keeping the linemen safe. I'll just run through a few of the particulars. This stuff is really a smart material. It activates within 20 seconds of seeing the temperature that would activate it right around 380F. It swells around and insulates the pole. It prevents the pole from burning. And that where it says withstands 12 foot flames, that should not be in there. That should have been edited out. It, it'll withstand temperatures up to 2100F. We've done it, actually Cal Fire asked us to do a double burn without rewrapping it. And we did a triple burn for them. And it did not, char the wood basically at all, less than a 30 second of char behind the armor belt. Durable barrier, certainly designed for linemen and to keep these things from tipping over in fires. It self heals like when you can, you can still climb the pole with your gaffs. Um, and when we talk about self healing, it, it'll poke a tiny little hole in it where your gaff goes in. This material will hold up to 490 pounds of weight uh, double wrapped. The conductivity piece, I'm sure it, somebody's wondering about that. It has been third party tested and certified to be no more conductive than a pole with nothing on it. Very cost effective. You're talking maybe a few hundred dollars to wrap the entire pole with this material. I'm sure that's why some of the big utilities in California are already doing it. It has no harmful VOCs, does not leach any harmful substances. Um, it's easy to apply. Stella Jones, they wrap probably 100, 120 a day at Fresno, McClellan Park and their Eugene Yard and sometimes in Tacoma as well. And I think one thing to remember in the industry, poles were trees. And having grown up in the timber industry, I'm certainly biased, but I would say this, and you can repeat this anytime you'd like. Trees are 100% recyclable, 100% solar powered. They sequester carbon, this stuff that'll kill you, and they make oxygen. It's quite a nice invention. It's the most sustainable answer to having the grid up, in my opinion. When you think about fiberglass, steel, cement, and I know they have good uses in big cities where trucks can hit these things and so forth. But at the same time, you are using the most sustainable solution out there when you use wood for poles. There's about 5,000 railroad trestles in California. They lost a few in fires. Uh, we're talking to uh, the UP, BNSF to start wrapping the uh, downslope, cross canyon, upslope systems of their trestles to protect those from fires. You can see some of the results in the middle picture. California has just over 4 million utility poles in their state. And again, 
we're working with utilities, mainly again, west of the Continental Divide where the droughts are pretty heinous. We're also working with AT&T and some other folks around there, uh, protecting their steel buildings and buildings around cell towers and that type of thing to make sure that the uh, 911 systems stay intact during fires. Some of the steel work we've done, you can see that graph right next to the picture on the left. Uh, that is the work we did for the metal buildings. It's eighth, eighth inch thick, and we stayed below 131 degrees Fahrenheit out to easily 10 minutes. And the unprotected, you can see the red line, it was above the temperature where steel would degrade. Um, you can again, use armor built on lattice towers, wood poles, steel poles, fiberglass poles, you can put it on anything. Um, it's, not, it's not very hard to attach. When they, when they use it on uh, wood poles, they use inch and a half staples with a, a one inch crown on them. But that said, with a stainless uh, zip tie, you can put it on steel, fiberglass, and so forth. This material can be sprayed on the lattice towers, the steel structures, the prefold system you're seeing down there at the bottom, that is mainly around being able to uh, have the railroad folks be able to use this on their trestle timbers. So we do a prefold on it so they can pop it right onto their, you know, four by tens or whatever they're doing uh, for their attachments to and erect their structures. And then this graph basically shows it's in Celsius, but really what it demonstrates in the blue line is the protected material and the red line is the unprotected. And when you see the red line jump up there at around five minutes, that's where the three impinged gas burners come on in the 10 minute test. So it jumps up quite high right there. And the protected material, that's, that's why you can see the efficacy of armor belt with regards to how, it, how well it protects the wood. These are some of the systems we're engaging with. Residential homes, we're talking to the insurance folks in California and other states in the West to be able to wrap houses under the siding. It'll also be used as roof underlayment under three tab or what have you on homes. We're building that right now. Obviously it can be used for railroad trestles on uh, anything that's near the fuel. Telecom systems, bottom left, protect the buildings. You can also put it on the upright. And then on internal uh, for homes, we can use it between multifamily uh, units where there's a shared floor or wall, and it will stop the fire at the floor of the adjoining uh, units. So these are some of the spaces where engaging with right now. And again, it's a fairly new product, but at the same time, there's quite a high interest in it. Backup power systems for cell tower systems, data centers to protect the information flow, uh, fire doors in hotels, internal for homes, EV battery systems, that's kind of the dirty little secret. Those are incredibly dangerous, the, the lithium battery, when if one of those gets uh, hole punctured in it, uh, it burns incredibly hot. And then we're working with the uh, oil and gas folks to put it on tank tanks in tank farms and on their pipelines. But that's it for me. I really want to thank you and I'll, I'll field any questions you have. I guess I'll just leave it on this one right here while we're having questions. Okay, Scott, thanks very much. Uh, we do have a few a few questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first question is, does armor built increase the lifetime of the pole? That's a great question. The, I think intuitively you could arrive at, one, we blow the holes open in the fiberglass mesh as it's made. So it goes through a dip tank. And then the air knife just blows a little holes open and then it's cured. And then when it's wrapped on the pole, that, that system with holes in it 
after a rain event allows the water to condense away from the wood. So it does not promote rot and so forth on the pole. And then again, intuitively, a pole that would be exposed to a fire is going to be damaged to the point where it's quite likely going to have to be replaced. When we do the, do these tests on large poles or the full size poles, they go ahead and they pull them on a three point uh, pull test to make sure they have the retained strength needed. But yes, indeed, it will it will extend the life of poles, especially in fires. And the reason I say that is we've had this armor built in our quantitative ultraviolet systems for the equivalent of 44 years. We just passed 44 years and it still passes uh, the burn test. Now, when I say in the quantitative ultraviolet, that's got a rain cycle. It gets very hot in there and then it dries and it runs 24 hours, seven days a week. And it's been in there well, the ratio is 17 to one. So one week in the QV equals 17 weeks to the wind. So we know we're, we've been in there at least 45 years and it still works. But the answer to that is yes, it will quite likely extend the life of poles, especially if, if they were exposed to a fire. Okay, the next question was, um, well, can this material be used to wrap and protect other tower structures besides wood? Yes, this can be used on steel poles. There's a couple of utilities out there right now putting it on steel poles. They overlap it about uh, inch and a half, two inches for each wrap. It's four foot wide. And uh, they use a stainless um, zip tie type system to hold it on there, just pinch it tight to the pole. But they do in fact, uh, put it on fiberglass poles and steel poles. And it can be, it can, uh, for lattice towers, it can be sprayed onto the uh, lattice work from the ground level up to say, it depends, you, you're going to want to protect a pole about three times the height of the fuel load. So if you're, if the tip of your fuel is say four foot, uh, manzanita, bitter brush, that type of thing, sagebrush, you know, is four foot, you'd want to go at least three times higher than that, but most of them wrap in that 20 to 21 foot range. So yes, it can be used on steel fiberglass. Okay. Um, how do these, t how do these telecommunication poles ca catch fire when they are built with steel? Oh, they don't catch fire. What happens is uh, there's quite a movement around leaving the grounds and so forth very natural around these cell towers and communication sites. Each of them have usually two buildings. One of them has a backup power building that's normally steel, and that has a diesel generator, and they're mandated to have about uh, 72 hours of backup power that they can run um, if the normal if the more normal grid power goes off. And so what we're doing is we're protecting the steel building so that the components in, well, the other building holds the hardware that runs the software that allows all the communications to take place. So what we do is we wrap the steel buildings. We can make it look like siding. You can paint it, all that stuff. So it looks pretty natural. But that said, it's really around protecting the backup power and the hardware that runs the software but on the, on the cell tower pole itself, that's steel, they wrap that up to about 21, 26 foot so that it never, the steel never gets hot enough to degrade or change the alloy to where it would crack or tip over in a high wind. Okay, fine. Next question, would this wrap protect the pole from woodpeckers? Well, I have a, a few good names for woodpeckers and it's not woodpecker, but I'll tell you this. Uh, we are working on different woodpecker solutions right now. It's a big problem. Um, if we're working on that with Stella Jones and we have found a bittering agent out there that won't hurt the bird and we're getting it as fast as we can through the EPA. It used to be registered in the US and Canada 
to be able to use. And what we would do is incorporate this bittering agent into the armor built formula as it's produced. Uh, and then it would be basically encapsulated in the matrix of the armor built. Um, I've, and so when the bird comes along, we've done it. You know, you can put, we put this stuff out with uh, suet feeders and so forth and a flicker woodpecker will come along and taste this stuff and where they have a little freak out and they don't come back. Uh, the bottom line is without something like that, and, and it's basically the taste receptors is how you have to get to these guys. Um, they're very, very tenacious birds. I've seen them go through quarter inch chicken wire. They're, they're quite amazing. Um, but no, uh, a woodpecker would be able to get through armor build if it made its mind up to do so, as it stands right now. But we're working on the solution. Okay. Uh, how much does the product hold up against weathering in northern climates and road salt, along with car and truck oil from the road when raining? You know, the armor built system, it starts out as an adhesive and goes on to that fiberglass. I talked about how strong the fiberglass was. It's a very, very, very robust uh, system when it's fully cured. When the armor built weathers, it literally turns into, I would describe it as the uh, bed liner in a truck that's sprayed on. You can drag your fingernails across it after a week of exposure and it will bend your fingernails back. Mm -hmm. um, it really literally turns into something like rhino skin or, or, or that material that's sprayed into uh, truck beds to protect them. It's very, very, very tough. So it's an irreversible cured system. Uh, that, and again, in the quantitative ultraviolet, it's not changed in 44 years of equivalent exposure. All right. Uh, okay, so the next question was, how long before it needs to be replaced, and if it ever needs to be replaced, and is there a warranty? You know, we do have a 20-year limited warranty on it. It's for a replacement. Uh, the main thing is just getting it on the pole correctly. You're going to want to overlap an inch and a half to two inches uh, per wrap because it's, you know, four foot and you're going vertical. Um, mainly, Stella Jones puts it on in the, in the horizontal. And they're really quite good at it, uh, their wrapping crews. But that said, uh, what was the other part of your question, Randy? I'm sorry. The, is there, is there, how <laughs> long, sorry, let me go back. How long before it needs to be replaced? Oh. And is there a warranty? Yeah, I talked about the warranty a little bit. That they're, they're, the data right now reflects that we're going to last beyond 50 years. Uh, in, in to the wind applications, freeze top, you know, <laughs> all that type of stuff, uh, barring vandalism, I guess that's what we would say is we, we are quite confident it's going to go beyond 50 years. So I think people that put the poles up out there, they're hoping they're going to go 60, 70 years or longer, and they typically would. Um, but that said, protected with armor built, they'll probably last even longer. And the reason I say that is, UV is the toughest degradation uh, element out there in nature. Nature always wins given enough time. But the armor built literally protects the wood and the surface of the wood from that UV exposure. And again, after a wet event, the water is going to be able to condense away from the pole. So it literally, it, it quite likely is going to extend the life of the pole. It doesn't need to be replaced unless a fire comes along. The bottom line is if a fire comes along and it makes it into mass, it protects the pole. The pole's still going to be there. It's going to be exactly what it was before the fire came. And it's going to take at least six to eight years for that fuel load to be able to grow up around or near that same pole. So you've got plenty of time to get out there and replace it. And you just, you can literally cut it off with a razor knife and uh, just rewrap it. Or you can wrap right over the top of uh, the, the layer that was uh, into mast. It doesn't matter. You can wrap right over the top of it. You mentioned earlier that it costs a few hundred dollars to wrap a pole. What is that? What does that compare to as a percentage in percentage terms of the cost of the pole? You know, poles in, in and of themselves before, you know, when, when utilities buy them, they're, they're in that, 
you know, 1100 to $1,800 range. I mean, depending on the class and length of the pool. A lot of folks are out there hardening their grids and going to bigger pools. But that said, um, you know, when you, when you think about the cost of replacing a pool that's in service, it can be anywhere from twenty to forty thousand dollars to for a crew to go out there and replace a pole. I'm not kidding. You can look it up. <laughs> I was shocked when I saw those numbers. Right, because is the because the pole's been destroyed because of the fire. Well, indeed, fire, seismic, you know, truck hitting it, whatever it's going to be. Right, pole replacement is very very expensive, and to underground systems, I mean, people talk about you know, putting things underground and then they won't burn. That's, the bottom line is those costs get passed on the consumer and it's about three to five times more expensive to underground the line than it is to put it overhead. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay, uh, next question. Do you have special protection for waterlogged areas? Uh... Those, I I don't, I know that the water is going to get to the pole if it's a waterlogged area. It's going to get to the pole through the armor bill. It, it is permeable that way. Um, so no, that we, would, we don't have a way to protect the pole from water, although there are systems out there, uh, the ones that you, like the systems that you put on poles for pilings and and mm -hmm. peers and so forth. Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Uh, is it sprayed or wrapped? Can it be applied in poles during service conditions? Yes, it's, it's, you can spray it or wrap it. Mainly they're wrapped. And really what we're talking about, and what was the other part of your question, Randy? It was... Is it sprayed or wrapped? Can it be applied in poles or to oh. poles during service conditions? Yes, you, you can wrap them in the vertical. They call that in situ. And yes, there are people out there right now wrapping poles in the vertical that are already out there in use. Uh, Stella Jones, when they move these poles to their big utilities, they're wrapping them in the horizontal. It's passed all the handling tests with grapple hooks and running up and down the road on trucks and rail cars and all that stuff. I've got pictures of wrapped poles <laughs> on rail cars and trucks going up and down the highway. But uh, yes. You can wrap them in the vertical, no problem. Uh, Osmos is out there doing it, and some other uh, pole servicing outfits. Yep. You know, uh, you know, the poles are often burned at, at, at ground level or below ground level. When you install the wrap, do you have to dig around the bottom of the pole and install it below the, uh, the, the surface of the ground level? You know, that's typically a good idea, Randy. Good question, whoever's asked that, because... I asked that question. <laughs> yeah, well, because when, when you put the pole on the ground, it usually softens right around the pole, and you'll get a, you'll get a dish of uh, surface, surface level drop. But normally what you'd want to do is dig around, dig down to about one foot and, uh, and, and wrap about one foot below ground level. And, and that's what all these folks do. They, when they put a pole, a new wrapped pole in the ground, they bury it one foot in the ground. Then they bring it to ground level and it's wrapped all the way to the tip. Uh, but yes, okay. that's a good idea. How would this work with the regular pole testing to confirm that the pole is still in good condition? Would this wrap cover the pole and prevent inspections done by utility crews? No, you can uh, you can still service the pole. In fact, you can do core drills and so forth right through the armor belt. Uh, the the easiest way to do that is just take a razor knife and cut a little uh, flap door in the armor belt. Do your core drill test, whatever you want to do, and uh, and then staple that little uh, doorway back to the wood, or or if it's a small drill hole. It'll literally self-heal. It'll just close in on itself after you pull the drill bit out. How does it do that? How does it oh. self-heal? Yeah, well, there. I mean, I guess the bottom line is there's still a little hole in it, but uh, we, we've done that work and we've burned it after we've done that work, after you poke all the holes in it. 
with climbing gaffs and core drills and all that stuff. And so when you think about how, like that picture behind me, how Armor Belt works, it's expandable graphite that's in the formula. And so when that graphite expands, it plugs the hole. So all you really have to do is force the fire equation to fail. It has to have oxygen, fuel, and point. Right. And when and when the intermess plugs the hole, the the fire equation fails. Okay. Is next question, is there any risk for mold development underneath the wrap? No. No, we've done that work as well. And we, we've got long-term studies going on in Arizona and different places in the north, northeast, and that kind of thing. It hasn't been a, around long enough to say definitively what would happen there. But at the same time, we do open the holes on the mesh entirely. Uh, and so the air can always get to the pole and condense the water away from the wood. Le leaving an environment that's not very attractive for mold and, and different things. Well, do these poles have to be treated anyway? Yeah, they, they wrap, all, all the poles are treated for longevity and so forth, but yes, they wrap right over the treatment. DCOI, Penta, CCA, all of them, yeah. They and do, right and do those treatments react with the, with the material? No, it's an irrever irreversible cured system. It's basically inert. Uh, it there, there, there is not a chemistry in the treatment realm that reacts with Armor Build at all. And Armor Build, again, once it's fully cured, it, it basically has the half life of a nuclear winter, if I'm being honest. But uh, take that with a grain of salt. We know what we know. Um, but no, there's no, there's no reaction. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Scott. That was a good presentation, and thank you to everyone for all the questions that uh, that came in. That was great. Oh, here's another one, Scott. Uh, does it protect against minus temperatures? Yes, in freeze thaw, we've done that work as well, and of course, they've been exposed to lots of freezing conditions. And uh, it does not crack. It's very, it's it's very pretty much ductile. Uh, you know, when it's fresh, new, whatever, before it's on the pole, you can bend it, uh, shape it, all that kind of stuff. But once it's around the pole and in in the uh, around the circumference of the pole and stapled on or, or fastened on, uh, freeze thaw does not affect it at all. Okay, that was the other question I was going to ask you was about temperature rating, ambient temperature rating, its Im impact on, you know, the, the life of, of the uh, material. Does it matter if it's cold temperature, ambient temperature, like in, in northern climates? What is the durability of it in, in countries where it's a lot of humidity? Have... Yeah, it's, it's blind to temperature, quite honestly. I mean, obviously, when you get things, you know, down to freezing, they get stiffer, just like anything will. Um, and then when it's warmer, you know, in the hot systems, you know, Southern California, Arizona, where they use it, I mean, they're using it down there. Yeah, it's a little more ductile when it's hot like that. But it, again, it's a fully cured system on a, a very, very tough fiberglass mesh, does not come off, irreversible cure. Um, if anybody wants to use my email, uh, just send me an email and I, I will send you physical samples of Armor Build, uh, an eight by nine that fits in a FedEx envelope. Um, no problem, you, you, we'll send it to you and you can, anybody can have it, touch it. Okay, here's another one. Can it be reused? Can it be removed from a pole and then reused and placed on another pole? Yes. You could, as long as you didn't tear it up too bad. I mean, the bottom line is you'd want to get those uh, st staples, just pull it off the staples and so forth, and then cover up the part that you, you know, tore a little bit. But you could reuse it, yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, thanks very much for the uh, those additional questions. Okay, everyone.